Hello, and welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. <clears throat> the conversation with Bibu Dev Mitra is here very shortly. I just wanted to let people know that I am uh, I have completely filled the September 28th Angelic Magic class, but I still have openings available for the UK European October 5th Angelic Magic class that starts and then um, lasts for four classes. And I also have one um, set to uh, West Coast US time, also for October 5th, for anyone who's interested. I also <clears throat> am planning on doing charts for people, both natal, uh, that's birth through 40 years of life, and also Navamsa, that post 40 years of age chart. So people can learn about their karmas and what's coming up in their life. I'm going to be doing those at least through the end of October, possibly longer, but I may be cutting them off at the end of October. And it's not completely um, formulated yet, but I will be teaching an introduction to Vedic Astrology class for those who are interested. And finally, I am offering spiritual guidance for anyone who wants to work through any moderate to low level trauma or get spiritual guidance from the angels or from me just to help you to be able to navigate the craziness that is Kali Yuga. And so all those links will be provided below and enjoy the interview with Babu Dev Mizra. All right, bye-bye. All right, hello and welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. And I'm continuing my conversation uh, with the fantastic Babu Dev Mizra. Uh, if you haven't, you should go and watch part one, and I'll put a card up there in the corner. This is one of those uh, shows where you really need to watch part one to fully understand it. So if you're listening to this and you're interested in the yuga cycles and the fact that Kali Yuga ends in 2025, go back and watch part one, get that context, uh, because I think uh, it, it our conversation part one was really important. Okay, so, so Bibbo, I'm going to put up this chart that you shared with me. So... We've been talking about the Yuga system and how Kali Yuga is coming to an end in 2025. Now, um, there's some disagreement among people, uh, or a lot of disagreement, I should say, among people uh, about the Yuga system. And we talk kind of about the different iterations and why there might have been mistakes in the past due to lack of knowledge or the angel said it was critical for you know, spiritual evolution at the time that Steiner and Yukteswar got the yuga model um less than perfect and that you seem to have perfected it and you you get you pointed out that you have the benefit of the internet and it's much easier to research nowadays i i gave the explanation that, that the angels had told me that um actually that incorrect information needed to come out at that time in order to give people sort of hope that the Kali Yuga was imminent because none of those people who heard that information at the time would actually live to see the end of the Kali Yuga. And that for the spiritual development of humanity, because we are in that ascending Kali Yuga, which does mean that even though it doesn't look like it, there is a, a, a slow spiritual awakening occurring um, that people needed to hear that. And then previously it could have been that the group that I called the Malachians was intentionally black pilling people with these insanely long 1.2 million year call yuga cycles or whatever it is and so i'm going to put up this chart and i just want um to hear your comments on it that this is your initial chart and then you've actually come up with one that you've since perfected a little bit more and so this was your initial chart and so can you explain this for the viewers what we're looking at here yeah yes yeah. so you have a 12,000 year uh, descending cycle and a 12,000 year ascending cycle. This is what mm -hmm. Yukteswar had also suggested and I adopted that principle. But uh, the difference in Yukteswar's formulation and one that I have here is that every yuga from Treta Yuga, Dwapara, the descending Kali and the ascending Kali, all of them are of 2,700 years duration. And that 2,700 years is based on a particular calendar that we have in India which has been used for thousands of years. And that was the primary means of reckoning large cycles of time in India. And that cycle is called the cycle of the seven sages or the Saptarshi ca uh, calendar. This mm -hmm. 2700 year duration is called a Saptarshi Yuga. And I believe that this is the duration, actual duration of a Yuga. And then you have a 300 year period of transition after a Yuga. This, mm -hmm. adds, up to, and this adds up to a total of 3000 years. So mm -hmm. every yuga is every yuga is of three thousand years duration, and out of which two thousand seven hundred years is the actual duration of the yuga, 
and you have a 300 year period of transition afterwards and mm -hmm. it's also preceded by a 300 year period of transition because they're all in a sequence so you have 300 years before the yoga you have 300 years after the yoga and so this cycle now you need to have a starting point i mean how do you fix a starting point for the cycle now mm -hmm. one of the starting points of the saptarshi calendar is this particular date, 6,676 BC, we know this date. One, Saptashi calendar starts every 2,700 years. So mm -hmm. one of the starting points is this particular date, uh, 6,676 BC. Mm -hmm. And when the Greek, and when the when Alexander came to India, uh, he was accompanied by some of his historians. And when they went back, they wrote about the Indian uh, beliefs and traditions of that time. And one of the points that they made was that Indians were counting their kings from a person called Dionysus or Bacchus, uh, who ruled 100 years prior to 6,676 BC. That is, he was ruling in this particular period of transition between the Treta and the Dwapara Yuga, this particular period. Mm -hmm. So my point, my question was, who was this person called Dionysus or Bacchus that the Indians were counting their kings from? He must have been a particular king on the Indians' kings list. The Greeks called him Dionysus and the Romans called him Bacchus. What was the name by which Indians knew him? And then I came across a beautiful piece of uh, uh, article written by Sir William Jones. He was one of the scholars of the 18th century. And uh, Sir William Jones had come to India as a, a, during the time of the British. And he wrote an article. And in that article, he said that uh, the person that the Greeks called Dionysus is the same person that the Indians called Rama. So ah. King Rama, who was... So Rama was Dionysus, and Rama, after he had uh, ascended the throne, he went westwards with his army of uh, Vanaras. We call them Vanaras, and in Greek uh, uh, paintings, they are depicted as satires. So you see these uh, people who are looking, uh, who look like humans, but they have the tail of a horse, and they have this some kind of a bestial feature. They have uh, uh, the ears of a horse and the tail of a horse. They're the satires who followed uh, Dionysus when he went westwards. And he hmm. was also accompanied by some minas. Minas were the female, uh, 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 the female companions of the uh, the satires. And I figured that they are the vanaras who uh, who are the uh, who followed Rama on his war campaign. So the uh, Rama and the vanaras are Dionysus and the satires. And Dionysus's wife was Ariadne, Arian. And Aryan was Sita because uh, Aryan had a pair of twins and Sita also had a pair of twins. So there were a lot of things which were adding up between uh, Dionysus and Rama. And I realized that, yeah, that, that makes perfect sense to me. And I followed up uh, with a lot more detail on that particular association, which is not so important right now, except to uh, all we need to know that Dionysus is Rama. And in the Indian uh, chronological system, Rama lived in the period of transition between the Treta and the Dwapara Yugas. So I knew that, 6, 000, that the calendar which starts in 6,676 BC must denote beginning of the Dwapara Yuga because Rama lived in the period of transition between the Treta and Dwapara Yugas. And he was dated to 6,776 BC. So 100 years prior to that date, that was the time that Rama lived. Mm. That means 6676 BC must be the beginning of the Dwapara Yuga in the descending cycle. And so this was the anchor point that I needed uh, to fix the Saptashi calendar to the Yuga cycle. And as soon as you use this as the anchor point, you are ended for the Kali Yuga. I can't see the bottom of this. Yeah, so you yes. have the end day of the Kali Yuga is 2025 CE. I I can see it on my screen. I'm sorry, it's not showing up on yours. I'm pretty oh, sure okay, it'll no, show it was, up. No, no it, it, got, it got hidden by the bottom uh, uh, bar. Labels. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, bottom bar, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's 2025. That's the end date of the Kali Yuga. So, I, I, so there are two points. First is that it was the Saptashi cycle of 2,700 years, which is driving the Yuga cycle. Which is, mm -hmm. uh, which is the basis of the yoga cycle reckoning. The second point is the 6676 BC date for the big, uh, it, it denotes the beginning of the Dwapara Yuga in the descending cycle. And I got this from proper historical records. It's not something that I made up. It's yeah. there, it's written there. It's there in the Greek records of India. And the association between Dionysus and Rama was made by Sir William Jones, not by me. 
I just put them together, and there you have it. The Kali yeah. plans in 2025. Awesome. So do you want to show that? Do you want to show the corrected chart or do you want to show that events chart? What do you think is better? Would you like to show the corrected chart to where you realized about oh, the, okay. the procession? procession. Oh, okay. I, I want to add a couple of more uh, points to this particular oh, uh, oh, chart. Let me, let me go back okay. to the share screen and then, um, and then we'll do that again. Uh, I want to make sure I got the right one. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to spoil the next one. Go ahead. Yeah, the reason why I felt that this particular cycle makes a lot of sense is because each of these periods of transition that you find in this chart, this between the Sati Yoga and the Treta Yoga, Treta and the Dwapara, Dwapara and the Descending Kali, and the Descending Kali and the Ascending Kali, each of these periods of transition was marked by a global collapse of civilization across mm. the world. It was not it was not unique to one culture, to India or to Greece or Persia, to Mesoamerica. And you can look, if you look at these numbers, you'll know it by, uh, for yourself because uh, the first, the, the earliest transition uh, was from 976 BC to 676 BC. And this is the period that we know as the Greek Dark Ages. That was the time that there was a collapse of civilization across the entire Mediterranean region. And after uh, the, 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 the huge number of city states were absolutely destroyed and raised to the ground. And it was only around 600 BC that we see the beginning of the Iron Age civilizations. And that happened across the world. In India, the Iron Age culture begins in 600 BC. In Greece, it begins at around 650 BC. Persia, uh, wherever you go, this was the beginning of a new phase of civilization with new uh, ideologies, new architectural styles, um, new, uh, new uh, artistic methods. Everything was new in the Iron Age. And that start and that uh, coincides exactly with this particular uh, day that we uh, that we have here. And then if you look at this particular day, three six seven six BC, which is the date that I had for the beginning of the descending uh, Kali Yuga. Mm -hmm. We have the civilization starting in Egypt at around three thousand five hundred BC. That was the time that the Gerzian culture emerged and they laid the foundations of the Egyptian culture. 3600 BC is, is the time, 3500 BC is the time when the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian culture started. Mm. The dynastic period, dynastic period started at around 3500 BC. That was the time that the Indus Valley civilization started uh, in India at around 3400 BC. So this was a time when there was once again a new burst of civilizations across the world and all the other, all the older civilizations which existed in those areas had been kind of wiped out. They were removed without uh, much of a trace. And then 6676 BC, you don't have too much data except you have, except in the Black Sea region where you see that there was a major Black Sea catastrophe. And then there was a new culture emerging in Southeastern Europe. You don't find uh, too much data about this period across the world. The data is not there. But then again, if you look at 9676 BC, this was the time that the Ice Age came to an end. You had the 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 geologists at the Niels Bohr mm -hmm. Institute they have they have dated the end of the ice age to a specific year. They are saying that the ice age ended in exactly nine thousand seven hundred and three BC. In a period of only one year, the temperature went from uh, temperatures increased by nearly ten to fifteen degrees Celsius all over the world. And this was followed by the emergence of the megalithic culture in Gobekli Tepe, which has now been dated to around 9,600 BC. And we can be pretty sure that Gobekli Tepe is not the only place where civilization emerged. It's the only place we have found till now. And there must have been a burst of civilization elsewhere in the world after the Ice Age came to an end. There would have been many, many set settlements all over the world. So the reason why I found this uh, uh, framework very convincing is that each of these periods of transition, you have a, a collapse of civilization, a kind of uh, removal of the civilizations of the previous period, and you have a new emergence of civilization following this period of collapse. And, and it adds up so perfectly that I knew that uh, it's, uh, it's the right one. You know, it's interesting because also in this nadir period, which would be the lowest ebb of consciousness, and then, you know, you would guess that like 150 years prior to this would mark the beginning of an upward movement in consciousness, Right in between these two here on Kali Yuga would have been the building of Solomon's Temple. And then the destruction of Solomon's Temple would have happened after that, talking about, you know, that's just another anchor point that it happens there in the middle. I've often said that Solomon's Temple 
is the, the, the absolute lowest point is when he built that temple and then it started a movement upwards would have been right in this transition period between the, the, the descending Kali Yuga and the ascending Kali Yuga. So that's another anchor point that I think um, speaks not only to a civilizational turning point, right? But also to yeah. a consciousness turning point because Solomon marks a real shift from the sort of warrior king uh, era, right? Abraham th through David to a more philosophical, uh, spiritual, uh, the Solomon and after period uh, in Judaism. So it's just another little marker that fits right into your system, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, the, one of the one of the points that I would like to make is that in the ascending Kali Yoga, we may not necessarily have a very strong flowering of the consciousness. It's probably more to do with uh, better living conditions, more uh, the better wealth, more wealth and prosperity. We know for a fact that our lifespans have increased in the ascending Kali Yoga uh, from around sixty, uh, from uh, from from, uh, from an average of around uh, fifty or sixty years around. Uh, in in the BCE years, from mm -hmm. uh, let's say around zero around zero BCE, you had an average lifespan of around fifty odd years, and you have average lifespan of around eighty years now. So there has been an increase in the lifespan, and mm -hmm. there has also been an increase in our wealth and in our prosperity, mm -hmm. which in turn which in turn gives us the opportunity to elevate our consciousness. But because we're still in the Kali Yoga, and because our Cranial volume, you know this, uh, I don't know if uh, people know this, our cranial volume has been decreasing ever since the whole beginning of the Holocene period, ever since the end of the last, last ice age, our cranial volume has decreased by 10%. Wow. And a, lot, a, lot of people don't, a lot of people don't know this. This is a very carefully guarded secret, but, it's, but, the, but the scientific data is out there. You can find it if you look for it. And it's never discussed on any mainstream media or any outlet. You don't read it in any textbook. But we lost the same amount of brain volume in the last 10,000 years that we had supposedly acquired the last two million years. Mm. From, hom from Homo erectus to uh, the beginning of the Holocene period, we had supposedly gained 10% of our brain volume from 1350 cc to around 1500 cc. And we lost the same amount in the last 1200, 12,000 years. Mm. So that, and brain volume is the main indicator of intelligence it's a it's an indi indicator of emotional intelligence it's an in indicator of memories our memories have declined substantially which is why we can't remember anything right now and the people of the ancient times like you mentioned earlier used to uh, memorize gargantuan volumes of texts uh, pretty mm -hmm. effortlessly and uh, we have also lost all these subtle qualities of the mind like our intuition our clairvoyance our foresight all of those subtle qualities we have lost, which is why our telepathy, you know, because the Hopi say that uh, people used to communicate with the animals in the higher ages. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, and probably the animals still try to communicate with us, but we don't have that uh, ability anymore. Uh, so our cranial volumes have uh, declined and it seems that it's flattening out right now. So the decline is more or less over. Yeah. Which is why, which is why I think that in the Kali Yuga, you can enhance your consciousness only if you are actively uh, trying to do so because your brain volume is decreasing. You're not getting any smarter. But if you use the technologies or the means that are being developed by the purely materialistic culture, then you have the opportunity to elevate yourself uh, spiritually and uh, you know, purify your consciousness. But that entirely depends on your willpower. If the yeah. willpower is not there, it's not, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that that's really interesting on a whole host of levels because, um, and I'll, I'll throw I'll throw it up for the viewers. I often talk about. In fact, here I'll just I'll just uh, I'll, I'll put it up because I think it's a useful um, thing to just talk about. And then I want to go into your next. Um, I want to go into the next section we discussed here. So just a second. Oops, I hit the wrong one. Gosh darn it. I have multiple things that look similar, and I hit the wrong one here. So let's do share screen. Come on, there we go. We'll do this, and I gotta close this thing I opened by mistake. 
All right. So um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I talked about the Malachian versus Luciferian versus Most High. And down here, there's this uh, material stagnation, there's dead materialism. And then as you as you move upwards uh, in consciousness, there's the spiritualization of humanity, which comes from the Luciferian impulse and also that crossover in the Venn diagram with the Most High. And you'll see up here individuated telepathy. Right. So there's this hive mind of groupthink, which is which is very um, negative. Right. It's top down. One ruler tells everyone what to think and then they they feel forced to think that way versus individuated telepathy, where we are able to immediately communicate with one another. And we have harmonious all is one, all is God. But within that, we have the individual, which is very important because the individual is how we evolve spiritually. And while we were talking about cycles, I don't see these cycles as a circle. I actually see them as it appears as a circle because when you look downward at a spiral, it looks like a circle. But I see that actually there's an ongoing evolution upwards. And for example, the most recent golden age, we talk about Atlantis in the West. Uh, you solved a mystery I've had for a while of was the empire of Rama the same as Atlantis, but you solved it for me. No, it was not. That was a Treta age shifting to Dwarpa age civilization. But prior to Atlantis, there um, is a discussion of, and I just use it, you know, people don't like the term for various reasons, but the term Lemuria is used for a prior civilization before that. And then there's discussion of Mu, which might be Lemuria or Hyperborea before that, but there's been a number of different golden age civilizations, just as there's been a number of different Kali Yuga and so forth. And so it was interesting to me that you said this thing about that we've lost these higher abilities such as telepathy. Well, I believe we're moving towards that as we move towards the golden age. So <laughs> it's just remarkable because we're going to see this increase in, in spiritualization and there has been a burst yeah, we're still in the Kali Yuga, but there has been a real burst in esoteric knowledge, especially in the past century or so, thanks to, or 150 years, thanks to people like, she's a very controversial figure, but Helena Blavatsky, uh, the Theosophist, and then Anthroposophy, which came out of that, uh, which was a Christianized version of that with Rudolf Steiner, and really it was in many ways a rediscovery of um, Tibetan and Hindu texts that were brought forward and sort of the dust was brushed, brushed off and it was brought forward again. And the West suddenly became aware uh, more generally of things like the chakra system, right? The energetic system of the body. Um, a lot of this knowledge that um, had been suppressed or destroyed, I believe it existed in the West, but there was a very... Uh, I really see the West as sort of the ground zero of this Malachian energy. I mean, I use a Western deity, Moloch or Haman Baal, to describe it. Um, and that's not an accident because the the dead materialism really spread out of the West. I mean, now even in India, you have a lot of dead materialism. And that didn't exist in India 200 years ago before the British came. That is an artifact of the British coming over and imposing imperialism and colonialism on uh you know the indian people that this idea of dead materialism which now is quite common in indian culture certainly compared to 200 years ago so i see the wet the so-called western civilization as the epicenter of this lowering of human consciousness and you really see it in this pattern of burning of knowledge destruction of knowledge and then spiriting it away and keeping it for themselves uh, but there was this sudden burst that has happened in the past 150 years uh, uh, or so, and it comes in waves of this higher knowledge. And you can even take it further back. One of the big ways I describe the difference between what I call the Luciferian elite and the Malachian elite is if you look in uh, the history of Venice and Florence in Italy, Venice is very uh, dead materialist. They say humans are just meat machines. They, they conceive of economics as a zero-sum game. The only way I can get richer is if I steal your money because the universe isn't making any more land, this kind of theory. Whereas the Florentines said, no, the universe is infinitely fecund. It keeps making new uh, resources that we can share if we harvest them right. Technology can 
make it so resources become spread more widely and a rising tide can lift all boats. And we're uh, made in the image of the creator and that we're creative beings, right? We're not just destructive controlling beings, we're creative. And that's that Luciferian impulse that's like the publishing of the Hermetica is kind of a real turning point in the West because that's when you get the Renaissance. And then that's suppressed by this Malachian force out of the Vatican and the Venetians. They suppress it and destroy it. But then it comes up again in the Enlightenment. And then they smash that down. And then it comes up again in the Scottish Enlightenment, which led directly to the founding of the United States. And for all the faults of the modern United States, which again has been hijacked, you'll see this impulse will come up and then it will get hijacked or controlled by the Malachian force. That Luciferian Promethean impulse comes up and then it gets hijacked by this Malachian energy, which is still dominant. And so the United States at its founding, yes, it had slavery, which is Malachian, because as I said in part one, this Malachian Luciferian thing, the Luciferians had to, in order to have any power at all, they had to work kind of hand in glove with the dominant Malachian power structure, but they would try and push against it where they could. And so in the United States, there was this idea of liberty, this idea of property, freedom of speech, which then spread around the globe to some degree, uh, but it really originated in that impulse. Um, and so you see how there is actually a movement within humanity, it's a small percentage of humanity of this spiritualizing that's increasing. And we're going to go into your rectified chart here of where you, you made it, um, the transition period's a bit different in order to rectify it to the procession to equinoxes. But one of the things the angels have told me is that, yes, Kali Yuga's ending, but these Malachians aren't going to give up without a fight. Uh, I believe the Luciferians will emerge successful. I believe that they will actually maintain uh, a global civilization. I think that actually... Um, the Kali Yuga civilization transforms slowly over time into the Golden Age civilization and that it's only on the descending end, and I know we disagree on this, it's only on the descending end that there's this complete wipeout of civilization. I mean, we really, even our records back 13,000 years ago aren't very clear, so anything prior to that is hyper-speculative, in my opinion, and so who knows, right? We're going to see, but I believe that we're going to see, yes, we're going to see a lot of death and destruction, but I don't believe that we'll collapse completely to no civilization. I believe that there'll be a, an amount of civilization that we can build upon that's global in nature and that we will see a big reduction in population, which means those people who are developing themselves in the way that you described, right, that are putting in that effort, they're much more likely not to fall for a lot of the tricks and deceits and destruction that they, they will be spared and that will create what's described as a founder effect. People who are more questioning, people who don't just slavishly trust authority, right? So that's that Luciferian or most high impulse, right? Those two groups, the Luciferian group and the most high group, that's who's going to survive this coming harrowing. And they're the ones who are gonna therefore have children and that's why there'll be that increased cranial capacity will come again because the people who will survive what's to come and are better equipped to survive this chaos that's about to unfold, which we'll describe in a second, they will have children and grandchildren and so forth who will have that increased cranial capacity and that culture of developing oneself on these higher levels of compassion and wisdom, intelligence and spirituality. And so do you have any thoughts on that before we put up your next chart? No, I, I agree with that. I think uh, I don't think that there's going to be a global eradication of all life, but mm -hmm. I am doubtful as to what what extent the to what extent our civilization will survive. I have great doubts about that because it's reasonable. Whenever I, because whenever I what I've seen in the past is that whenever uh, these we go through this periods of transition, uh, carry forward very little in terms of actual physical structures. We carry forward the knowledge and the skills that the, the survivors, they carry forward the knowledge and the skills, but the previous civilization is almost completely destroyed and covered under heaps of mud and you have to basically dig uh, dig it up again. For example, mm -hmm. when, when the Indus when the Valley civilization collapsed in 1000 BC, around that same period of time that we had 
uh, that last period of transition, uh, the Greek Dark Ages, and the Indus uh, civilization completely collapsed at that time. And then it was forgotten for the last 2,700 years. It was rediscovered in the 19th century. It was lying under some 30, 40 feet of mud. And we had to dig them up. But that doesn't mean that the that traditions or the cultures or the skills or the spiritual knowledge was forgotten. The survivors carried that knowledge to the next uh, uh, cycle. So mm -hmm. there are people who survived. So what I believe is that people survive and they carry forward the knowledge, but the structures don't uh, seem to survive at all. But and especially, go ahead. And especially in times of uh, transition like the one that we're going to have now, which is like a very big transition because it's a transition from Kali Yuga to the next civilization, which is Dwapara. And it's like going from darkness to dawn. It's a big transition. It's like going from winter to spring in the cycle of seasons. So we had a similar transition at the end of the Golden Age where we had this Atlantis and everything uh, disappearing. and uh, so uh, and and that particular episode was so destructive that we still haven't found the remains of Atlantis. It's, it's, it's totally vanished. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this particular transition is also going to be pretty destructive in terms of physical damage, but not in terms of spiritual knowledge or skills. Well, let me let me add a counterpoint. Would you agree, uh, just a short question, then I have a response. Would you agree that we have almost no records prior to Atlantis? Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. So then we don't know. My theory is, is that we have a, yes, I believe a big pattern of the population is going to die. Yes, that implies many cities will be destroyed. But I think that when you're moving upwards, that those transitions aren't nearly as devastating. In fact, I would imagine they're much, much smoother. And that on the but descending, not, they're more destructive. Do you see what I'm but saying? But we're not yet. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. But what I think is that this particular transition that you're talking about, that's actually on the ascending half. We're not yet there. We're not yet in the ascending half. We're still in the descending half because until the Kali Yuga is ending, we're still, even though it's, this is the ascending Kali Yuga, but our brain volumes are still decreasing. Until your cranial volume is on the upward curve, you're not really on the ascending cycle of consciousness. We're still in the descending cycle of consciousness, but there has been a spurt of consciousness in the last uh, 100, 150 years, simply because of the uh, material changes, the technology changes that came in through our intelligence. So it was a intelligence which was driving the change and making it possible for some people to elevate their vibrations, not for everybody. It's a very yes. small percentage of people you're talking okay. about. Less, less than 1% of the people you're talking about here. Yeah. And, uh, well, so so let me, let me again, push back just a little on that. And, the, and I love that we're disagreeing here because that, that helps us both think, right? We, we don't want to have that Malachian hive mind. We want to have robust discussion. I theorize that, yes, I believe that there is going to be, because it's the end of the Kali Yuga and the Malachians don't want to let go of power, that there is an upcoming, and the angels have told me this, there is an upcoming bottleneck event where I've been told at this point it's unavoidable that billions with a B will die. How many billions is dependent on choices that we make because it is still a free will universe. But I would imagine that those transitions are much, much more smooth and that we are seeing... I mean, there's a huge difference between that movement, you know, I'll put up the chart again here, the movement here between this, um, you know, the end of the Dwarpa Yuga, 3600 BCE, and, you know, even what happened here with the Greek Dark Ages, like you were saying, you know, the, uh, that this era was like, things have been improving during this past 2700 years yes there's been a lot of horror but the material things have been proving and indeed material improvement is required according to maslow's hierarchy of needs you have to have food and water and shelter before you can and sex before you can start having realization of the higher levels that implies to me that as we continue to increase in consciousness that there would be increasing amounts of stability over time until eventually when we get to the Satya Yuga, it would be extreme harmony and very little change 
you know, during this, you know, period of time that there would probably be, yes, there'd be a phase shift and it'd be different, but perhaps it wouldn't be nearly so devastating because it would be an increasing levels of consciousness and things have become increasingly more stable, right? Like just look at the past 75 years is much more stable than if you look at the period of time from World War II and the hundred years before that, there was all manner of different incredible things going on. I mean, the colonization of India happened during that period of time, 1840 to 1940, right? You had the American Civil War in the 1860s, right? You had the Napoleonic War, I guess, is a little bit further than that. But the point is, there was just constant, constant, constant chaos, but things have been getting more stable. That doesn't mean that I don't think a lot of people are going to die. Unfortunately, I do. But I think that the people that are going to survive that won't be having to completely reconstitute civilization. Uh, and I also doubt that as you move from Dwarpa to Trada, it doesn't make sense to me or Trada to Satya that it gets completely wiped out and then they make a new civilization. I think it's that they yeah. refine the prior civilization, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I think on the ascending... Yeah, I, th I agree with you with, uh, with the ascending cycle because when you are in an ascending cycle of consciousness and there's really no need to uh, destroy all the uh, physical structures and because we will be on an ascending cycle, you're not going to treat the environment in the same manner that we do today. I mean, look at the mess we have created in the environment today. Yeah, Even absolutely. though we are get, I mean, there's so much, uh, uh, you know, garbage. Uh, you have nuclear waste. We don't even know how to get rid of that uh, nuclear waste. and so much mining and we've, we've made a mess of the environment let's just say that yeah so how are you going to how, how i mean we don't even have a plan to clean it up we don't know how we're going to get rid of all these greenhouse gases that we've emitted and we continue to emit we don't mm -hmm. even have a plan for that and it's getting worse because now you have this blockchain technologies all these new buzzwords the blockchain technology like ethereum takes up the same amount of power like a, a small country like thailand or some other country so you're getting more resource intensive technologies. AI is extremely resource intensive. You're mm -hmm. not cutting down on your, you're not cutting down on your uh, pollution at all. You're just increasing it uh, manifolds. Mm -hmm. So, but when you're on the ascending cycle, you are not going to have any of these kind of technologies. All of this is going to go. It's very useful. Some of it is very useful to us right now uh, because it helps us to get that knowledge to get up to speed to what's actually happening, what actually happened in the past, what might happen in the future. So it helps us in our development, but none of this will be useful in a higher yoga because then the right. doorways of then the doorways of real knowledge, real truth, real light is going to come in. And we don't even know those doorways exist now. We have forgotten that those doorways exist because uh, we think that those are legends and we don't we don't believe in interdimensional beings. We don't uh, believe that there are gods or angels or other kinds of beings. We don't believe that humans interacted with them in the past. We don't believe that they're going to come in in the future. So, but once those doorways are open, you don't need these kind of proven technologies anymore because right now you might do a Google search, you might come up with a 1 billion results and all of them could be wrong. But in higher yoga, you get the information, the right information from the right source, and you don't need to doubt it anymore because these are beings who know what has happened in the past over millions and millions of years. They'll give yeah. you the right information. And you can go with that information and then build your life on top of that. So it's a much, it's an extremely different kind of a scenario that's going to unfold in the higher rivers. And you just can't visualize that with the basis of the kind of technologies that we have today. We're struggling with the technologies that we have today. We, Literally, you have to rack your brains and, you know, you have to search in so many places. And even then, you don't even know whether you're, you're basically groping in the dark. You're touching yeah. bits and pieces here and there. And you think, oh, this is nice. This makes sense. Let me put this and this together. But we don't have the whole picture at all. We're completely yeah. disconnected. We're completely disconnected from other realms of the, uh, other realms of existence. We're disconnected from our own inner source. And we're disconnected with the environment. We don't even feel it. Uh, you know anything for our environment for the planet mm -hmm. so that has to go there's a big jump in consciousness that we have to do once we cross over this valley but to the golden age and most people don't even know that they don't even realize what the what the change is going to entail in terms of a consciousness shift yeah so so which is why i don't think any of this is going to uh, carry forward because this won't serve any purpose in a high rig of most of the stuff and the technologies that we have today is not going to serve any purpose in a high rig we wouldn't need it need it. You wouldn't need these medical technologies if nobody gets sick. 
in a higher ego, people don't get sick so easily. We don't need those medicines and this uh, all these uh, you know laser machines or whatever we have. Yeah. Right. So so it's a paradigm shift, and I, I find it very difficult to explain it to you know people because you know they don't believe in most of this stuff. But yeah. What I see is that the our conditions and, uh, of life is going to change radically. It's going to change so drastically. It's difficult to believe even now. Yeah. Think about it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's beautifully said. And um I, I want to show your next chart and I want to get through these last two charts. And also I know it's it's getting very late where you are, so I want to honor your time. Um I will just say that uh th there's something uh the, the galactic cross will be exactly zero degrees Capricorn about 70 years from now. And I kind of mark that as when um uh I, I kind of mark that as when for me, I know that you linked it to the trader you get for me, and also based on what the angels have told me, that's when that's when we're really moving into a new cycle completely. And that's the moment when one of the things the angels have told me is that this period of time is a great karmic reset. It's a period of time in which all the souls that are incarnated right now are having their the karmic books are being cleared. You, you see it in the financial system. Right. But it's also all this debt in the financial system. But it's also true, again, as above, so below. It's true on an individual karmic level. And that's why we're again and again meeting people that we right now. If, if you think about it in the past five years, I maybe you haven't, but I've experienced it to where I meet a lot more people to where I instantly love them or instantly I clash with them. And what the angels have told me is that all these karmas are coming up now to be paid back. And that that's why we're all having such a difficult time is because we're, we're being forced to face our karmas, both in this life and also past lives that we can't remember. And that we have to release ourselves from that karma in order to be ready for this next cycle, this ascending cycle that you're talking about. And so um, I want to get to the next screen you have here. So you notice that 2400 years doesn't quite fit with what um, uh, the, the procession of the equinoxes and the 20, is it 25,900? Is that right? 800, 800. 25,800. Yeah. The procession of the equinoxes. And so here it is. You, you, you then perfected it a bit more with an increased uh, period of transitional time between Kali and Dwarpa Yuga and Satya and Treta Yuga. And do you want to discuss this chart a bit now? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, in the, the in the Greek text, uh, what you find is that they talk about an extended period of devastation, extended period of transition, which happens at the end of the Golden Age. And then another one happens after the end of the Iron Age. And they, they have two specific terms for it. One is the one is called cataclysmus, which is the one which happens at the end of the Golden Age. And this is cataclysm means deluge or the flood. Uh, this is the time that they believe that the flood had taken place. And they also call it the great winter. And mm. that makes a lot of sense because this time period from 10,876 BC to 9,676 BC is the time when the earth went through a period of great severe cold, which is known as the younger Dryas period. Uh, because the ice sheets were melting uh, for, since around but since around 20,000 BC, the ice sheets were melting. And then all of a sudden, for around 1,200 years uh, from around 10,900 to 9,700 BC, the world re-entered into the ice age once again. The glaciers started advancing. And people didn't know, and historians or archaeologists didn't know what triggered this uh, sudden return to the ice age conditions. And recently, a team of um, geologists led by Firestone and his colleagues, they said that, there was a episode of heavy cometary bombardments at the Younger Dryas boundary. And that cometary bombardments uh, led to the extinction of all the Ice Age megafauna, like the mammoths and the saber tooth tigers. It killed off all the megafauna. And it also destroyed the civilizations of that time. But that doesn't mean there wasn't any civilization during the uh, period of Younger Dryas. There were civilizations, but they were much smaller and they lived in small settlements. The kind of that, and those are the settlements that kind of grew into the Treta Yuga cultures later on after the Ice Age ended. Mm -hmm. and so, and, and on the other hand, they said that uh, there's another extended period of devastation after the Kali Yuga, uh, which they call ekpyresis. Now, if cataclysmus is 
younger dryas, then it must be of 1200 years duration. And I mm -hmm. saw, and I thought that, okay, in that case, egg piracy, which is, which means conflagration. That means this is the time that the world is going to be destroyed by a fire. Last time it was by water and this time it's going to be fire. So every, everything's going to get burned. Uh, that's how the cleansing is going to take place. And, and the wildfires that we see happening around the world today could be a prelude to uh, those events that uh, we were talking about. And egg piracy should also be of 1200 years duration if the first one is of 1200. So if you add those two, then the total duration of the yuga cycle becomes 25,800 years, which is exactly equal to the cycle of precession. So effectually, you just have one cycle, a well-known astronomical cycle for the precession of the equinoxes, and that is actually the yuga cycle. Mm. And it just so happened that bits and pieces of this knowledge was scattered all across the world. The Greeks had some part of it, the Indians had some part of it, Mukteshwar had some part of it, and once you start putting them together, then you see that this whole image makes sense. Uh, it, it actually answers the questions about our past, about the events that happened in the past. Mm. Because, uh, because you could, uh, and the reason is that you couldn't have this younger dress period as long as the golden, was, uh, golden age was still in progress. That had right. to happen after the golden age was over. And we know that was of 1200 years duration. So this one must be 1200 years duration. So when you add that, it's 25,800 years. That's Which awesome. That after after 2025, we actually go into a 1200 year period of transition. And I think this is also what is mentioned in the uh, some of the scriptures, because it says that when uh, after the second return of Christ, he's going to set up a golden age of a thousand years. I believe that those are talking about this 1200 year period of piracies, even though this is going to be a time of destruction of civilization is still going to be a golden age. Why? Because it's a golden age in terms of your consciousness and not in terms of your physical possessions. So so I want to bring up an esoteric point. Perhaps ekpyros is fire, right? It's fire. Well, fire is also known as spiritus. And Jesus said, I come to baptize you not with water, but with spiritus or fire, right? Elemental fire. So I have on, and you may be interested in, in watching some of the things on my channel, but in particular, I interviewed a gentleman named uh, Peter Champu, who he's a geomancer. So he does ley lines and the magnetic grid of the earth. And he believes that that was used in like Atlantis as part of their technology. They took advantage of the earth's magnetic grid and interacted with it and so forth. But he says that there is a scholar who says that there's this great plasma undulation that comes out of the galactic center. And when we're in the Kali Yugas, it also is when the Earth is passing on that outer spiral arm of the galaxy, because by the way, I believe in space and planets and not a flat Earth, <laughs> that as it moves around the galactic center, um, we go through a period of time where we go through uh, where there was a supernova of an evil star or a dark star. And that that particular part of the galaxy is sort of haunted and allows this lower astral energy to come through in a greater way. And in 2024 to 2025, and he arrived at this from a completely different point of view from you or I, we move out of this low plasma wave to where we move into a higher amount of plasma comes from the galactic center. And with that will come a burst of light. And it may actually be that what's going to happen is, yes, there's going to be this destruction, but at some point during that destruction, which I don't think is going to last very long, th this is just my personal belief. And again, we can disagree. I think that there's going to be a wave of consciousness that comes along with that plasma from the from the uh, galactic center and that we're going to see that we'll be bathed in fire this fire of the plasma burst from the from the uh cent center of the galaxy but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's fire in the sense of being burned to death it could be that it's a spiritual fire that enlivens and invigorates us spiritually and that it creates that that mini golden age that you're talking about that then allows us to kind of look over. There will be, again, I, I what the angels have told me for what it's worth, and again, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, but they've told me that from 2025 to 2027, 2028, there's going to be this massive conflict, but it will be very br brief and very brutal. 
and that the group that I call the elite group that I call the Luciferian faction is going to use their extremely high technology to very quickly wipe out the Malachian faction. And that by what the angels have said to me is that by 2030, they will have pretty much wiped them out and that a new era is going to begin to start in 2030. Now, that doesn't mean that like it's an instant golden age. I don't believe in that at all. I still see that Luciferian consciousness as not the highest consciousness, right? Um, what the angels told me is that during the Kali Yuga, Haman Baal or Moloch rules, that during the Dwarpa and Trita Yugas, Lucifer rules, and that during the Golden Age, the Most High, whose name has been lost, rules. And these are just Western terms. I'm certain that there would be an analogous figures in the Hindu pantheon. I haven't really thought that through well. And so my apologies to you. Obviously, we're talking about a Hindu concept of the yugas, which I think is magnificent. Uh, I just simply haven't thought it through in that way uh, because, you know, I, I come from a Western background and I work with the angels. And the angels have told me they're also the devas and have encouraged me to interact with their, their deva aspect because they say that there's an aspect that operates differently because it's interacting with a different cultural group. And I look forward to doing that at some point. But thus far, I've been interacting with them through sort of a more Western framework. And so that's why I put it in those terms. Uh, but that in 2030, things will be sort of settled in terms of this really evil force will be removed, but there'll still be this group that isn't the highest consciousness and that will have to evolve over time to eventually make it to the Sat Yuga. But that this transition might be in certain respects very quick. Although I think that a 1200 year transitional period where kind of that consciousness fades more and more and more makes a lot of sense to me. In other words, the Malachian consciousness will so exist to some degree I've been told certain hallmarks of it, like pedophilia, will be gone uh, in terms of on a global level, it'll be gone by 2030. That's what the angels have told me for what it's worth. That And that that is key because something about that anchors that lower consciousness. It opens those portals to the lower astral, the same way you talked about that portals to the higher realms will begin to open. That also implies that these lower portals will be closed. And what I was told by a shaman almost 20 years ago now was that the number one, and he was a literal shaman as in a Siberian shaman. He was from a, a lineage and, and I apprenticed with him for a while. What he told me is that the single most important thing for people who are, I don't know, to use a new age term, light workers or people who are aligned with the most high is that we got to wipe out pedophilia because he said that about 6,000 years ago, Dark sorcerers in the Middle East were told by demonic forces that there was a greater power that they hadn't interacted with, some sort of demon god. He didn't use the word Baal or, or Moloch, but that's clearly who he's referring to, and that the way to access those lower realms was the harm of children. And so they started doing that, and that then opened the portal. And so all these things we're talking about, I mean, the degree to which they're metaphorical or whatever— uh, I don't know. I think I think they're I think they're true on many levels simultaneously. I tend to think that there's many levels to reality and that they operate simultaneously. And so we move out of the plasma wave. You hit that zero degrees Capricorn with the galactic uh, cross. Um, you know, you move out of the Kali Yuga. Uh, we move out of that plasma. The plasma field comes in. We move out of that dark star. I mean, all the, you know, the pedophilia gets wiped out. All of these things can be happening simultaneously and they're not mutually exclusive. And, and they're also, you don't have to believe in all of them to believe in one of them. That's also true. So um, I want to get to your final chart because I want to talk about, I see 2025 to 2028, as I just explained, to be, it'll be a big conflict between the previously dominant force of the Malachians and the new dominant force of the Luciferians, which are much more positive. They're not perfect. I still see them as a false light, but they're way better. They're far more evolved. And um, so how do you see 2025 and beyond playing out? And is this a good time to put up that third chart, the one with the transition period? Oh, that's that's about the, what happened in the past. That doesn't okay. talk about what's going to happen, happen in the future. 
Okay. So what I think is that one of the things that happens uh, typically happens in a yuga transition period is that there's uh, the, the, you have large scale wars uh, breaking out. So we had that in all the previous transitions. People uh, people get into some kind of a frenzy and that triggers uh, big global conflicts. And I think we are already seeing that happening now. And I have a feeling it's going to just scale up in future. And by 2030, we might even have a <clears throat> global uh, the third world war. Uh, so that's one of the things that uh, I think uh, might happen is probably going to happen because wars are something that just keeps on happening at every yoga transition. The second uh, second part that I have, which I haven't spoken about, I have written about it in my book, and uh, that's the return of the so-called avatar or the savior. And I believe that's going to happen in 2036. Hmm. That's a specific date for it. And that's going to end uh, the Kali Yuga structures and the philosophies and the ideologies. It's going to end in 2036. And in 2040, you have a, uh, you have a specific conjunction of planets in Libra. Uh, all the planets uh, are, will get clustered within five degrees of uh, each other in, in, in a five degree area of the sky, all the five uh, planets and the moon. That was a conjunction that a lot of uh, Chaldean astronomers were targeting as in the end of the entire descending cycle. Not just the end of the Kali Yuga, but the end of the entire descending cycle that started after the, uh, after, at the, after the end of the Ice Age at uh, 9,700. You see, that's, that's the entire descending cycle. That ends in 2040, which is why I believe that um, none of the Kali Yuga energies are going to carry on beyond that period. So 2040 is kind of, for me, the uh, end, end point of Kali Yuga energies. And beyond that, uh, whoever are the survivors, they will have uh, they'll have the minds cleaned up and they'll be ready to uh, start life in the mini, mini golden age of a thousand years, the period of expiracies. When, uh, yeah, and I agree with you that there's going to be a galactic wave of light coming in uh, during uh, this period and which is going to further purify our consciousness and raise our, and it's going to trigger all those dormant mental faculties which you need uh, to function in the higher yugas. And you're going to uh, interact with the other dimensional beings as well. And uh, without the use of uh, magic like you do now, because that's going to be more common for, <laughs> uh, that's going to be more common for people. And that's going to happen in my opinion after 2040. This mm -hmm. galactic beam of life, uh, or this beam of light that's going to come from the center of a galaxy, I have a different explanation for it. But it's not so really important right now because the technicalities are not so important. What I do believe is that there's going to be a pulse of light that's going to purify us, that's going to purify the environment, and that's going to lift us to a different level of consciousness, and that's going to prepare us. Not us, but our uh, next generations uh, who are going to inherit a new world and we're going to chart the way to the next golden age after, uh, after a period of thousand years. So that thousand year period is like the preparatory period for the next ascending cycle. That's when that's when you might actually, because after that period, some of these interdimensional beings, they may not uh, stay on earth anymore. They're going to stay on the earth for the thousand year period and they're going to train the people and then, they, then they're going to go away again. And then they might again turn into a legend, but they wouldn't because now the people would know. They'll, they'll have this higher level of consciousness and you might be able to uh, communicate with this higher order beings telepathically, even if they're not present on the earth, because now you know how to communicate through your uh, higher mental faculties. You're not restricted to your Google search anymore. Huh. So so that's, that's what I have uh, uh, envisioned and that's what I have written in my book. Uh, about this period. So I think it's the end times that the different eschatological doctrines talk about, all the end times that we have in all the texts, the revelations or the Puranas, or you have it everywhere. You have it in the Kala Chakra Tantra, and you have uh, in the other places, and all of them are talking about this small time period, this window from 2015 to 2040. That's the end times period. And it's very close at hand, which is why, you know, this is a it's going to be a very tough time for humanity in general because uh, I've seen that how people get so upset about what's happening now. And it's just going to be... <laughs> the... <laughs> and this is nothing. This is the good times. What you have now are the good times. And if you're getting so upset by what's happening now, you'll be uh, driven... You, I mean, you'll go just go crazy when the actual changes begin after 2025 and carry on till uh, 2040. So, uh, so this is a very good time. 
this is a time i think when we need to get more spiritually grounded get more mm. calm and more composed mm. and understand that there's a there's a divine plan in operation and there's really nothing much you can do about it other than first to ground yourself and then help others to do the same because you won't be able to make any changes in this uh, in this things that are going to uh, happen from now on because they are this is set in motion it's going to happen uh, just the way they have set it in motion and uh, you know that the, it out. <laughs> the angels told me exactly that they said that there's going to be a um there's going to be an event, and I don't know whether the event is a singular event or if it's something that happens over a period of time. But they said essentially as we get to this bottleneck, which will be both a reduction in population, but that it will also be a bottleneck in which there's a period of time where there's basically no free will. And as we move closer to it, we have less and less and less free will. And then there'll be some period of time, a window, and they haven't told me how long, but during that period of time, you'll have no free will. Things will just be unfolding. And the only place you'll have free will is in your internal response to what's unfolding. And within that, you'll still have total free will and that that's where the spiritual work is done. And that's where we cleanse these karmas that we've accrued as we've been incarnating during the Kali Yuga and harming each other and staring and in, staring into the abyss and doing these great evils to one another. As we've all done, Everyone listening to this, you know, you may or may not believe in reincarnation, but if you do believe in reincarnation, which I do, and I don't believe that reincarnation, by the way, is in contradiction to Christianity. I believe that the hints about Christianity were, or I mean, reincarnation in Christianity were deleted during the Council of Nicaea and elsewhere, except for one escaped where Jesus said, they said, well, uh, Isaiah is supposed to return. And he said, Isaiah has returned as John the Baptist. Everybody like kind of overlooks that or tries to explain it away. Because again, the Malachians got control of Christianity and created its dogmas and control, which doesn't mean that what Jesus said wasn't this ultra high vibrational teaching. It was. What people miss is that there's been a political structure that's been placed on top of that. And there's been edits to what he said. And still beautiful teachings have come through, even with all those edits, but a great deal has been lost. And I believe that part of that was he probably would have said that reincarnation existed. So whether you believe that or not, I do. And from the point of view of reincarnation, we've all been reincarnating during Kali Yuga. And I assure you that if you've reincarnated during Kali Yuga, you've been evil. Guaranteed. You can't get through 6,000 years of reincarnations during the Kali Yuga without having done evil. We all have, because that's how our soul or our mortal soul learns, is by doing these things and going, my God, what have I done? That's how you learn. That's how you evolve beyond that. That's what the Kali Yuga is for. The Kali Yuga is for us to explore our dark side and to determine, wow, that is horrible, Let's not do that for the next 26,000 years, guys. That was awful. Let's not even think about that for the next 20,000 years other than let's purify it. And now what I've been told is that during this bottleneck, which, you know, you're saying will last 15 years, um, the angels gave me a shorter time frame, but um, there's a period of time that they've been unwilling to explain, which is basically after 2025, they've been very scant on details. They say by 2030, things will be vastly better. So it was more, I got a five-year window. Uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's close enough. Five years, 15 years in a, you know, 26,000-year cycle, that's less than a rounding error, right? You know, and that hit 2040 versus that when the galactic cross is zero degrees Capricorn, 70 years, again, that's a rounding error in a 26,000-year cycle. The point is we're, we're coming up in this window and that in this window, it is of paramount importance, as Bibbo says, that we develop ourselves spiritually and that we should be spending this time right, right now in order to anchor ourselves. And in fact, one of the things where we do have free will, according to the angels, is the more work we do as individuals, the better the outcome, the more people who survive, the less hardship and destruction there is. There is going to be a series of events that happen that are Utterly, there's nothing that can be done about them. But what we do in this lead up is actually incredibly important. It's incredibly important. And that's why it's a paramount importance for all of us 
to integrate our shadow, to face our shadow, integrate it, heal it, start liberating ourselves from these karmas. So that way we can better take advantage of this upcoming moment. And so, um, Bibo, I ha I'll have to have you on again so we can explore this even deeper than we have. But um, yeah. I, I so appreciate your work. Again, if you go back and watch my videos, you'll see that I say your name all the time once I remembered your name. I used to say there's this Indian scholar whose name I can't remember because <laughs> I would always forget it when it would get to the moment. Uh, but I've been talking about you for almost a full year now, actually, and your work. And I think it's that important. And so please buy Bib Hu's uh, book. And what is it again? Can you say it? It's Kali, Kali Yuga Yuga Shift? Yuga Shift. It's not yet out. I mean, you have to wait yeah. for it. Yeah, I'm well, I will. It, uh, so I've... The minute it comes out, I'm going to I'm going to push it on my channel. 100 percent. In fact, I'd like to have you back on. That's a perfect time to have you back on for a follow up discussion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we need to talk a lot more about what's going to happen, and yes, uh, you know, have I, I have more material on that and more thoughts on that, so we can talk about it more detail. Fantastic. And is there anything you'd like to say in closing, Bibu? Well, it's just that uh, we are ending. We are uh, nearing the end times, I and mean, that is a big realization. I mean, all along we have thought that you know it's all myth. It doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. But it's going to happen in our lifetimes, and that's a big, big deal. How are you going to face it? What are you going to do when things go completely out of control? If you have, if you have been freaked out by that teeny weeny pandemic, what are you going to do when the real big changes start coming in? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that pandemic was nothing. It didn't even touch me. I wasn't, I wasn't bothered at all. I saw people out there; they were just freaking out, as if they're going to fall and die every, you know, every second. And what, what are you, how are we going to deal with things when they start coming in uh, big waves? So you have to anchor yourself. You have to ground yourself. You have, you have to understand that you're a spiritual being having a human existence. Mm. I mean, that's been said so many, that's been said so many times. But you have got to, you know, realize that you have to put some effort into that, because otherwise you'll find it very difficult to deal with the changes that are coming. Mm. And they're coming. I'm pretty sure they are. I can see it happening right now. Yes, beautiful. I, I would just say that um, that you, you don't need to be scared by what Bib is saying, because it's one of the things we talked about b before we started recording is the way that the population has had this exponential curve in this past 100 years, and especially in the last 50 years, you know, I'm almost 50 myself. And um, a lot of beings are incarnating right now to experience this spirits want to experience this it seems terrifying if you if you just think you're a meat suit and you just got one shot you're gonna die and then that's it it's a blank screen just the game over screen that's going to be terrifying if you understand that whether you're christian and you think you live immortally in heaven that's fine that's a fine paradigm and i'm not here to uh tr trash on any religion uh, if you believe that you just attain a heavenly state after death, that's beautiful. But again, you attain that heavenly state by doing good works, right? And that's really by learning spiritual lessons. For me, as someone who believes that we have immortal souls that reincarnate, I see this as an incredibly exciting time to be alive and a great gift. It's a beautiful gift to be alive right now. If you have the right framework, which is exactly what Bibhu just said. Start inking yourself spiritually, and then you can be in that flow state. I often talk about that scene at the beginning of the movie, Saving Private Ryan, where they're going and they're storming the beaches at Normandy, and the first ship opens and it lowers its gate, and just everybody on that ship gets killed by a machine gun fire. And then the next one opens that has Tom Hanks on it, even though I don't like that actor, uh, but it's important to the scene, and they go charging up the beach, and this guy... Uh, they're going up the beach and then this guy gets a sniper bullet. It goes Pating! off his helmet. And he and and he's so shocked. And his friend goes, you lucky son of a... And he takes off his helmet to look at it. And then he gets shot in the head. But some of the people survive and some of the people don't. And the thing is, is that you're more likely to be in that flow state to where you move with the grace of God. And you're able to move through these upcoming changes if you're anchored in that higher spiritual dimension that Bibu's talking about. And so rather than being scared, 
hear this as a call, as a challenge to deepen yourself spiritually, to confront your shadow and heal it. So that way you can help others and get them to be less scared about this transition. Beautiful things are coming for humanity. The thousand year reign that Christians talk about, the thousand year reigns of Christ. Kulki, uh, Krishna coming back as Kulki and beheading all the bad guys, right? That's another metaphor we can talk about here. Good things are coming, but, you know, uh, my last name is Ferguson. The Ferguson family motto is Dulcius ex asperus in Latin, which means sweeter after adversity. The, the sweetness of what is to come will be that much sweeter that we have pushed through and survived this adversity. And we can, and we will. And if you're listening to this podcast, you're far more likely to be well prepared for it than the vast bulk of humanity. And if you take action now, you might be astonished at what you're able to achieve and how you're able to help people around you. And so thank you, Bibhu. I'll have you on soon, as soon as your big book gets published. Thank you so much and blessings to you and your family and blessings to all of you viewers. Thank you. And if you got this far, please hit like and subscribe. Thank you and be well.